Hey everybody, this is Matt Sparks. I'm from Duke University, a nephrologist and a member of the Filtrate for Freely Filtered. I'm here with my colleague and friend, Dr. Samira Farouk, uh, and we're here to discuss AKI and COVID-19. Hi everyone, I'm Samira Farouk, a transplant nephrologist at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Uh, proud to be representing the Freely Filtered Filtrate here today and very excited to briefly talk a bit about COVID-19 and the kidneys and what we know and what we don't know. You recently were uh, first author on a paper in Journal of Nephrology. The title was COVID-19 and the Kidney, What We Think We Know So Far and What We Don't. Can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about the paper, the origins of the paper, uh, and the process you went through to, to write this? I think the key to this paper is really in the title and to really, we really wanted to get across not only a summary of the available data from clinical experiences and small clinical research studies that had been done so far, but also to really portray the uncertainty and how little information that we have and to suggest some hypotheses and suggestions for how we might move forward. And our strategy was really to try to cover the, the spectrum of kidney injury to first starting with the development of acute kidney injury. What is the prevalence of that? What are some potential risk factors that have emerged? And then also touching briefly on what we call special transplant and chronic kidney disease, as well as end-stage kidney disease populations, and how does this viral infection affect those populations in potentially a different way. And then finally, we, we had a section called a bit of a look to the future, and what can we do moving forward? What is there to, to study further? And some, some guidance for the nephrology community. One thing that I was struck with um, when COVID-19 sort of came through the United States was that it really showed the importance of nephrology um, as a frontline um, healthcare uh, force, workforce in, um, in all of healthcare. And I think that's something that was really highlighted. And so can you tell us, I think one of the most important things that we, we saw was that the high rates of acute kidney injury, what were those rates? And then how many of those individuals uh, required uh, kidney replacement therapy. I think what's really interesting about this is when the pandemic first began in China, the the rates of acute kidney injury that were reported were a bit on the lower side, and there were actually some reports that came out of China reporting uh, AKI incidence of zero percent. And so over time, as the pandemic more spread to the United States, we began to see at least increasing reports of AKI. And at our center at Mount Sinai in a preprint that was recently published, we reported an incidence of acute kidney injury of almost as high as 50%, with 20% of those requiring dialysis or kidney replacement therapies. And so the reason for that disparity or difference in acute kidney injury could be, there are many reasons for that. One is that the reporting of AKI itself can vary and is quite heterogeneous throughout these different studies, but we can also consider that these patient populations are likely very different and they may have different comorbidities, uh, different racial and ethnic backgrounds, different genetic factors that may predispose them to injury. Um, for example, we, we have seen several case reports that inheritance of the high-risk APOL lipoprotein 1 or APOL L1 allele can actually uh, be associated with the development of a, a severe form of kidney injury, specifically affecting the glomerulus. And so if we look at the figure, figure one in our paper, the incidence is really kind of all over the place and range, a range from zero to 50% for any other disease process would be considered quite a wide range. And again, kind of pointing to this idea that we don't really fully understand this process and we don't really know uh, what's going on and what the obvious risk factors are. So if you were to pinpoint a number of patients in the ICU, how many uh, that had COVID-19 would um, require kidney replacement therapy? Uh, with AKI? How many with AKI require um, kidney replacement therapy? Yeah, I think it's hard to give a number and maybe you can comment on your experience in the ICU at Duke as well, uh, but I, I think it would definitely be upwards of 50, 60, or even maybe 70 percent. Um, as nephrology consultants, we were obviously called for these patients that required dialysis in the ICU, and I'll just say that at the peak, there were many, many patients and more patients that had required dialysis in ICU that we had really ever seen before. And this required us to get a bit creative with how do we kind of ration a limited resource? How do we provide adequate nursing? And how do we try to provide as much dialysis as we can to the people that need it? And one of the I strategies agree. was yeah. actually to, um, to start the use of acute 
peritoneal dialysis in the intensive care unit setting, which is something that has never been done at my institution before. Yeah, definitely the creativity in trying to figure out how to deploy as much uh, kidney replacement therapy that was needed uh, was something that I also thought the community came together and helped figure out how to make uh, dialysate fluid, re um, the replacement fluid, uh, how to insert these catheters in a safe manner uh, for peritoneal dialysis. So um, yeah, the rates were, were astonishing. And I think that as a community, we, we, we were prepared, but from the reports out of China and other places, it did not initially seem like it was going to be uh, as bad uh, as it was. Um, now, this comes to a controversial part uh, and something that we've talked about on Freely Filtered and, and, and updated on the NFJC blog. Does um, SARS-CoV-2 directly damage the kidney by infecting the kidney? Has that been demonstrated? And what did you, you find in the paper on that? Yeah, I think that's a million dollar question. And a uh, short answer is uh, like many of the other questions that have come up, we just don't really know. Um, so what we found in our literature review putting together this paper was that there's really compelling evidence on both sides. And so kind of the, the pro um, is that there is a pretty compelling pathophysiologic hypothesis that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 provides for viral entry into the cell, as has been shown in the alveolar cells within the lung. And perhaps that could be one potential mechanism of kidney injury that the virus enters these cells and then can, can uh, potentiate some nephrotoxic effects. From a pathologic standpoint, an important question might be, well, if the virus is found in the kidney, then perhaps that's an indication that there are forms of injury. And so there have been conflicting reports of what looks like a, a viral-like particle that has been seen in electron microscopy. Some groups have been able to show that there's actually RNA material, which would be more confirmatory evidence that the virus is actually there. But then we have to ask ourselves the question, does the presence of virus, does that necessarily mean that there is injury? And so kind of a little bit of correlation versus causation that the virus is there, but what is it actually doing? And um, we don't really know so far. I think it would be interesting to do a study in the future if we're able to quantify the viral load in individuals, um, though we know that those loads are relatively low in the serum, if there's any correlation with the viral load and the extent of kidney injury. But because the viral loads in the serum have been so low, that provides may not be a great hypothesis to pursue because we obviously are seeing high rates of AKI, even though the viral loads may not be as high. Yeah, I agree. When I look at um, SARS-CoV-2 and AKI, uh, you see a spectrum, and most individuals will have acute tubal necrosis. And then you start to see uh, immune hyperactivation, interferon high states like collapsing GN. And then all the way to the right, I think a very, very small minority, I think could have direct infection of the virus, uh, but that has not been shown uh, very frequently. Um, and one of the biggest uh, areas in which we sort of got sidetracked is through electron microscopy, and people were publishing papers that showed um, small uh, circular structures that looked like um, the virus, uh, but from expert individuals in the electron microscopy field, it appeared that clathrin-coated pits can appear very much similar to that. And so that um, uh, we need to be very cautious just because we see a structure that looks like a virus doesn't necessarily mean it is. So I think in the end, we're left with that we, we're not 100% sure it's controversial. And if it does, it's a very, very rare event. I think the other component that kind of really cloudies or muddies this picture is that all of these patients have severe infection, um, they're in a state of severe sepsis, they have high inflammatory markers. And so it's almost impossible to tease out what is causing this kidney injury because many of these disease processes that have been described in the kidney, for example, you mentioned acute tubular injury, we know that the majority of patients that have severe sepsis, septic shock, will have acute tubular injury. And so is that the sepsis alone? Is that the virus really? Is it a combination of both? It's really has been hard to identify that. And similarly with the, there have been some urinalysis abnormalities that have been reported in these patients, hematuria, blood in the urine, proteinuria, and those are those because of the virus causing some sort of damage or is that again related to sepsis? Um, it's 
it has not really become clear. There are a few um, patient groups that I wanted to, to mention briefly, uh, and one is um, the risk in end-stage kidney disease. So individuals that, ha that are on dialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And the second group is um, kidney transplantation, uh, which is uh, an area that you practice in. So what is the risk in those groups? Is it higher? Uh, do they get a more severe form? Do we know yet? Yeah, I think they're two really interesting groups to talk about. And I think the two, one thing that those two groups in common is, have is that there is some problem with their immune system. And so obviously for patients with kidney transplant, they're taking exogenous immunosuppressants leading to a suppressed immune system. On the other hand, end-stage kidney disease patients, there's evidence that they may not only have immune system suppression, but also immune system activation in, in certain contexts. And so um, earlier on, I think for the end-stage kidney disease population, there was this suggestion that perhaps the disease is not as severe in them um, because of their immune system um, abnormality or dysfunction, that maybe they cannot really mount that same inflammatory or cytokine response that is seen in non-immunosuppressed individuals. And so there was this. And there were some reports and uh, editorials that were suggesting that perhaps this population is protected. I think as we have seen the pandemic unfold a bit more, um, I think higher mortality rates have been reported, or those that are actually similar to the rest of the population. Um, there's not a lot of data that has been published in this in this area, but from our institution, our inpatient mortality rate for end-stage kidney disease patients was around 20%. For outpatients, it was much lower. I think somewhere around three or four percent. And so those numbers are not that different from the general population. With respect to kidney transplantation, um, I think a big question that came up from our patients was what should we do to protect ourselves? And the good news is that patients with kidney transplant are somewhat accustomed to having habits or behaviors that try to protect them from different infections. They know for the most part that they are at higher risk. And so for them, it was really kind of reinforcing those precautions that were shared with the rest of the population, wash your hands, stay home when possible. And when they did develop symptoms, depending on the severity, we would try to manage them via telemedicine visits, or if they had more severe symptoms, bring them in um, for uh, admission. And our general approach was not really to cut the immunosuppression completely, but was really to kind of modestly lower that because there was not really great evidence, and there still is not, that completely this decreasing immunosuppression is helpful and potentially keeping some of the, that immunosuppression in the system may actually, in theory, be beneficial because it may um, mod, uh, mute some of that inflammatory response that, that occurs. And so, again, data in this population is also limited. Some reports have suggested um, mortality and morbidity rates greater than the general population, close to 30%. Other groups have reported uh, lower mortality, around 5 to 7%. Um, but uh, however, these studies are difficult to compare as they have uh, different uh, populations that are included in the reports, as well as the follow-up times that can range anywhere from two weeks to a few months. And so I think as time goes on, we will be able to understand this population a bit more. Um, and I'm actually part of a, a global consortium um, that's, um, that has enrolled uh, kidney transplantation from around the world, from several different continents. Um, and in that cohort, we found that the, the mortality rates were pretty similar to the general population around uh, 20%. Um, but again, across the world, we, there are different approaches in how to manage these patients. And so it can be different to, difficult to compare a group of patients that had full immunosuppression maintained and another group of patients in which all the immunosuppression was withdrawn. Um, so I think we're still learning about these patients and the approach has really been at our center individualized understanding the patient's immunosuppression regimen and modifying it and kind of observing the clinical response. Great. Uh, let me summarize where we are um, with COVID-19 and, and, and the kidneys, just where, what we've talked about so far. One, um, it has provided an opportunity and also showed the importance of, um, of nephrology care uh, during a pandemic, which is a very important point. Two, Acute kidney injury is common, and if that develops, especially in an ICU, the need for kidney replacement therapy is high. That means we as a workforce, as a group, need to understand that and have the resources available. Um, SARS-CoV-2 could infect the kidney, but it's likely a rare event. 
most AKI episodes are from acute tubular necrosis, which can be from a variety of things, just the, uh, the illness, being sick um, in the hospital uh, or in the ICU from hemodynamic factors and other things. Um, the risk in patients on uh, dialysis or those in the transplant, um, it's definitely not lower and may be comparable to general population to slightly worse, and we need to stay vigilant to ensure this vulnerable group of patients social uh, distance, uh, wear a mask, uh, and do all the things that need to be done to diminish their risk. And the last thing I want to touch is, are we better prepared, hospitals in the United States, for kidney complications now? What's the long-term implications uh, for individuals that had um, have gone through COVID-19 and maybe experienced acute kidney injury? Yeah, having been in a New York hospital that was, you know, in the epicenter, um, had having very high volume of patients that were requiring dialysis and kidney replacement therapies, I definitely think that if we were to experience a second wave of similar kind of volume of um, infected individuals, I do believe that we are better prepared. Um, in the initial few weeks of the peak that was developing, we tried different tactics to try to make sure that we were using our dialysis resources in the most effective way possible. And I think that we are well equipped to, to roll those out again. And we had put strategies in, in place to um, ensure that um, faculty and trainees um, were, were um, not being assigned to take care of too many patients. I think we could also reinstitute those rescheduling plans. We had specific plans for our nursing staff to ensure safety as well as adequate patient care for everyone. Again, I think we would likely bring back the utilization of acute peritoneal dialysis in the intensive care units. And so, you know, I think we have our, our plan that's written down and ready to go in the event of another surge. Um, obviously, we hope that doesn't happen, but I think to answer the question, I, I think we are prepared to handle what may be ahead of us. And um, the second question about um, long-term effects on patients, um, unfortunately, this is something that that we don't know, um, but I think most experts would agree that there will likely be some long-standing impact on the kidneys, and this will likely become an important cause of chronic kidney disease. And I know many institutions, including ours, have begun to build um, COVID follow-up care centers, um, which can be used, one, to not only better understand the long-term sequelae of this disease, but also to provide care for patients that may develop long-term organ damage. I know this has also been seen in the pulmonary world, um, long-standing pulmonary complications, persistent pulmonary symptoms like cough and shortness of breath. I don't think the kidney is that different from that. Um, as we know, it is a somewhat, can be a somewhat sensitive organ. And so I do think that um, particularly in those that had severe infection and severe acute kidney injury requiring kidney replacement therapy, we're likely to see some long-term sequelae and perhaps unfortunately an increase in the prevalence of chronic kidney disease. Yeah, I think what's most important is that um, clinicians and researchers continue to, to share their data in a rigorous and robust way with, with peer review and analysis. And as we move forward, we can hopefully put all of our, our hypotheses and studies together to continue to improve our understanding of this emerging disease process. All right, thanks a lot. I appreciated the, con the conversation and we'll see you on Freely Filtered. Yeah, see you on Freely Filtered and thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for listening.